a lot of women, if they had gotten $25,000 worth of clothing, nine times out of 10 had this about $25,000 worth of it. By her own account, however, Mary Always a Hard Charger was not the kind of woman who would wait for Holland or any other man. Anger built up in me, confusion, and I got involved with another guy, Jackie Wilson, to get Holland off my mind, she said. Wilson, the man for whom she had written Bye Bye Baby, had been her first crush. I idolized him, she said. I grew up with his music. Because she was now an international superstar, Wilson's handlers couldn't help but noticing that she was in the audience. Since they also knew that she had written her first song for Wilson, they would have been terribly remiss had they not invited her backstage after the show. Wilson reminded Wells of how much he admired her singing. Wells reminded him sincerely that she thought he was a great artist and that she had admired his music for years. Not one to Mr. Q, Wilson, who was separated from his wife, immediately invited her to dinner. She accepted and they went out to a fancy restaurant. He immediately heightened his appeal to Wells by educating her on what he saw as some of the nuances of high living, a likely turn on for the semi-fatherless girl from inner city Detroit. When Wilson asked Mary if she would like a drink and she suggested scotch and water, he told her a lady always drinks pink ladies and raspberry daiquiris and ordered her one of each so she could choose. After she picked one and drank it, he told her, this is as far as I ever want you to go. Just a small drink every night. From Wells' point of view, he had finesse. He had class. He knew the best places to eat. He knew how to conduct himself as a gentleman. To top it all off, over the next few days, she said, Wilson bought her $25,000 worth of clothing. Ooh! I wonder if she had sex with him, okay? Because... A lot of women, if they had gotten $25,000 worth of clothing, nine times out of 10 had this about $25,000 worth. They started dating regularly with Wells becoming more and more enamored. After three months, he suggested that she move into his apartment until her apartment was ready. Then the trouble began. First, there were the drugs. Wells saw Wilson messing with a white powder, which he told her was booger sugar. I'd never seen any booger sugar before, she said. So I said, what is that you're putting in your nose? After he told her, she said, I wouldn't dare put anything like that in my nose and didn't participate. Then there was the alcohol, lots of it. Jackie was drinking hard, she noticed. He's the only man I know who could take drugs and drink the way he did. Wilson also turned out to be extremely jealous and possessive. When Mary tried to leave his apartment without him at the end of their first week of living together, he told her, you don't go nowhere. You stay in this apartment. It's a beautiful place. Wells had had enough. When Wilson left the apartment on business, she called May, her BFF, James Holler, who was still living in their suite at the Sheraton and said, I'm coming home. Wilson came back, found out she had decamped to her hotel and became furious. He barged into the Sheraton suite where Wells, forewarned by the front desk, was hiding under the bed. You tell her that Jackie came by here to get her and I will be back, Wilson told me. Let me tell you how I got gooped when I started messing back with men. Okay, that time I had decided to, you know, make a leap and just go for it, I guess. I don't know. I was so lost. At times I'm still very lost. But in life, no one is ever truly solid. They can pretend, but as long as your future is not predicted by you, anything can happen. What really 
got me was when the Texan was so quick to bun me. He displayed jealousy. Uh, he was very macho with me. He was all those things. I mean, displaying um, extreme concern in situations. It was very quickly. I want to say within a month or two, right? But I didn't realize that that was all part of the game. And you have to be careful of those men that try to bun you so quickly because they have something that they want from you. But they realize that you're the kind of woman that you just can't be friends with and get what he wants from you. He realized that you're the kind of woman that you have to make a commitment with. So he makes a commitment quick, quickly with you, and then he goes in for the kill. Three months of knowing each other, he asked me to put his car insurance in my name. Better press him. Wilson was well known for his drug use, drinking, and womanizing. Wilson biographer Tony Douglas, in his book, Jackie Wilson, The Man, The Music, The Mob, refers to the singer's untold affairs with women, both married and single. Y'all, let me know if you would be willing to read the Jackie Wilson book. Among these women were both Wells and Joyce Moore before her marriage to Sam Moore of Sam and Dave. The two women later compared their experiences. Damn. I mean, men do it all the time. Matter of fact, y'all, oh my God, I was on the Instagram and they was paying homage to uh, my ex-boyfriend, my first boyfriend, okay? That's Lou, y'all. And y'all, this girl under the, the picture has said, I just want to go to the basement in your grandmother's house one more time. I put the eyes up and I added her. I said, what the hell you know about that basement? She responded back, what the hell you know about the basement? I said, I know that it's the turret dome when you get down there. I was too young to experience those kind of pressures as a child, okay? Because he was my very first boyfriend, okay? And, and that was too much pressure for someone's very first time. I'm talking a lot. I had some coffee, y'all. Mary's second romantic entanglement in New York was with the talented record business pro she finally hired as her producer, Carl Davis. Davis said he didn't know Wells was looking for a producer until one of the artists he was already handling, Gene Chandler, best known for his hit song, Duke of Earl, was appearing at the Apollo with Wells. Wells told Chandler she was leaving Motown and would need a producer. And Chandler, aware of her talent and struck by her general attractiveness and needy look. What the hell does that mean? Needy look. Desperation, maybe, okay. Suggested that Davis visit Wells to discuss that possibility. Davis, a Chicago resident, flew to New York to see Wells and visited her at the now fully decorated Park Avenue apartment. She and May James Holler, if I'm saying Heller, my bad, y'all, were sharing. An elegant two-bedroom suite with a marble foyer, white, and lavender rooms, white carpeting, a piano, and what Davis called a gorgeous Afghan hound. More important, a gorgeous Mary also was in the apartment. Like anybody else, David said before, I would agree to produce somebody. I wanted to get to know her. So I wanted to meet Mary and find out what kind of person she was. I found out she was a wonderful person, a lovely, beautiful, talented lady, and a great artist. They soon started a romantic relationship as well as a professional one. She was gorgeous and a really sweet person, David said. They were together for at least a year, working and vacationing. Carl was absolutely drop dead in love with her, Joyce Moore said. However, David said their relationship was plagued by jealousy. Pause. Why every relationship Murray Wells get into, it's always about jealousy and controlling. And then they act like the men just act jealous towards her. 
but she old maniac too. On one occasion, it was his jealousy problem. He heard a rumor that Wells was cheating on him with one of the four tops, so I broke up with her over the phone, he said, then flew to Houston for the first ever national R&B convention. Wells, in a fighting mood, called him there and told him, I didn't do anything wrong, and if you want to break up with me, do it in my face. She immediately flew to Houston, and when she walked into the airport terminal, Davis said, she was so beautiful, I forgot about the problem. Soon, Davis and Wells were engaged to be married, and Davis had given her an engagement ring. She's still very young. I think she's still in her 20s. So drama like this is to be expected, okay? What I don't like is you people that be like, I don't like the drama, I don't like the drama. But you make sure that the drama is right there, right there. Yeah, this is scary Mary being jealous. Mary had traveled to California one time to visit Davis and thought something was going on between this girl and me this girl that he was producing, y'all. Mary visited him in his room, broke a glass, and attempted to cut him with the jagged edge. He avoided injury, but had his room changed so she couldn't try to assault him again. He also instructed the hotel staff not to give her his new room number. When Wells recovered her composure and began feeling sorry for her actions, Davis wrote, she ran around the hotel looking for him, yelling, Carl, Carl, come back, baby. I'm so sorry. Scary Mary. That's what we call her. When Davis returned to New York, Wells became angry again and in his words had a hissy fit. She also threw at him the three and a half carat engagement ring that I had paid $20,000 for. He caught the ring in the air, but it wasn't a ring that he wanted. He wanted Mary Wells. David said he never could figure out why Mary was so jealous. Perhaps she hadn't told him about some of her previous experiences, such as her betrayal by Griffin. The relationship ended when Davis ran into Cecil Womack with whom Mary was beginning to get involved in Cleveland and had his own hissy fit. If she wanted Cecil Womack or anyone over Carl Davis, that was a bad decision, he said. I didn't want to have anything more to do with her. When I walked away from Cleveland, I never spoke to her again and never listened to her again. Mary's rock and roll stardom not only affected her ability to move about unnoticed in public, but it also inflamed her ambition and made her believe she could be a movie star as well as a music star. 20th Century Fox records fit perfectly into Mary's scheme because it was a subsidiary of the 20th Century Fox Film Corporation. Mary's movie, Ambitions also may have been another reason for her choice of George Schneck as her first post Motown manager after Herman Griffin. His major client, vocalist, shut up, Lou. His major client, vocalist Connie Francis, had moved successfully into Hollywood semi stardom, appearing in films such as Where the Boys Are. Follow the boys and looking for love. During negotiations, Mary had said she wanted to be a movie star and was promised that she would be one. So the liaison between her record company and her manager was this dude named Kraft. Kraft had made a promise to her just to get her there. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You want to be a star, girl? You'll be a bright one. Uh-huh. Come on, bitch. During the negotiations, Mary told him, that would be the liaison, Kraft, that she wanted to be a movie star, and he promised to make her one. That promise wasn't in the contract, of course, but why should I feel sorry I tricked her? If she's so crazy with overblown ambition, she deserves what she gets. Ooh. No, you're going to deserve what you get. Hold tight. Wells' longtime confidant, May, James Holler, put it more bluntly and truthfully in 2011. 
20th century did marry wrong, May said. They told her she was going to do movies and TV. Although Mary never made a movie at 20th, she was quick off the mark as a 20th century vocalist. I was a hit machine they thought could sell anything, she said. 20th century was a relative newcomer to the record business and anxious to succeed. Uh, Kraft, who had recruited Mary for 20th century, was fired after just three months in his job. Gentile said he thought Kraft was fired because Mary had failed to score a huge hit. Mary later expressed bitterness about Kraft's quick departure, telling Steve Bergsman that 20th Century had this guy who was supposed to be good at promoting black artists, but then they fired him. I was stuck there for a year and a half. Critics argue that Wells' problem at 20th Century wasn't the songs the company produced, but its lack of ability to promote black music. 20th Century Fox had very few black artists. No real soul or R&B acts had signed with the label. It was too uptown. They were mystified by me and they didn't promote me, she said. Gentile agreed. 20th paid a good price for Mary. They really wanted someone of her stature, but it was a big mistake for them. They didn't know what to do with her and promotionally they crucified her. The company, he said, had plenty of money and the name, but didn't know how to handle major artists, especially black ones. She told one interviewer in 1989 that Motown did everything it could to stop the black disc jockeys from playing my records. There's no evidence supporting the rumors and Motown has denied them. In spite of Wells' unspectacular performance for 20th, the company still had hopes for her. 20th century executives decided to try a new tact with Wells, issuing the surprisingly upbeat Me Without You backed with the wistful I'm Sorry in September 1965. Murray did well on Me Without You, but it didn't hit the billboard charts and rose no higher than number 99 on the cash box pop chart. I'm Sorry didn't hit any chart. Uh, ooh, ooh. Oh my goodness, that's too much pressure. When she left in October 1965, the company laid off a number of employees and tried to play catch up by launching a budget label called Movie Tone. In 1966, on the Movie Tone label, 20th also released the first album Wells did for the company under the title, Ooh, It Failed to Chart. Ah, ooh, it ain't look good. Oh, very. Oh, oh, oh. Good. Wells continued to feel that she had been mishandled by 20th. This feeling was vindicated when she jumped to Atlantic Records and scored her biggest post Motown hit. Although. You say that you love me. 